It's quarter to 8 p.m. South Africa time. Welcome to everyone around the world. So happy to have you all joining us this evening for what is our 150th webinar that we've run since lockdown began. And that seems like an awfully long time ago. So welcome to everyone. We're going to have a huge crowd this evening. Just based on the pre-registrations we've seen, there were thousands and thousands of people who are joining us from around the world. People interested in saving South Africa. And we hope that our three remarkable guests this evening will help, help us in that journey as well. On controls this evening is Danny Kadar. Danny, if you're with us, please turn on your camera and let's have a little chat. Benji Porter is going to be joining us as well. Musi Mamani has just come in. Musi, where in the world do we find you this evening? In the Great Republic of Cape Town. The Great Republic of Cape Town. Let's make sure that there's no succession in that republic. We want to keep all of our provinces together. That's how it is. Uh, it's just, yeah, it's a crazy universe, but all, all, all good. Good to see you, Howie. How are things going? A fantastic Musi today. Today, in fact, this week has been a very big news week. So in the Jewish calendar, we've had Yom HaZikaron, uh, the Day of Remembrance uh, for uh, for Israeli soldiers and others who've been killed in the Middle East. Uh, we've also had Yom HaTzmot, the 75th anniversary of Israel. We've had Andre de Reiter, busy appearing in Parliament today. And of course, tomorrow is Freedom Day. And we want to start off, Danny Kedar, were you old enough to vote on the 27th of April, 1994. Howard, I don't even think I actually truly appreciate what was going on. I was 10 years old. So all I remember was the TV screen. I remember two things. I remember the TV screen, jets flying over the union buildings. And for some reason, I remember the soccer party on the ballot. I don't know why that stuck with me. <laughs> well, I think that stuck with everyone. And in fact, the, the people who are in the IEC building at the time tell me the story of how a bunch of drunk and stoned people arrived at the offices <laughs> of the IEC, having taken a bet that they could register a political party and actually arrived with cash. It was all done in cash and paid their deposit in order to, to register their political party uh, in, 1990, in 1994. Musi, were you old enough to vote then? No, I was 14, uh, proudly so, but I... I managed to accompany my parents to go vote. That was nice. And I um, I remember it all too well. My grandmother was a <clears throat> staunch activist. So uh, she was a staunch activist and a staunch Catholic. You could literally afford to make your teacher pregnant, but you dare not, not go to church or, <laughs> or let alone... <laughs> go 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 vote. So she was quite adamant on both those scores, you know. So where did the Mamanis vote in 1994? Dobsonville DSJ in Soweto, yeah. Fantastic. And uh, you talk about your granny being a staunch Catholic. I don't know if you've seen Benjamin Zander, who we hosted at Jewish Achiever Awards, I think four years ago, I think you were at those awards, is performing with the Boston Philharmonic Youth Orchestra at Regina Mundi. Oh, really? And so I hope, you, I hope you come with me. It's in June and I hope uh, it's just before Youth Day and I hope you come join us at Regina Mundi for that performance. I'd love to do that because, um, I mean, I... Because we were so staunch Catholics, Regina Mundi is like the 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 if it's if it's if it's the branch of the Vatican. Everyone else is just uh, you know, so so it was quite. It's it, yeah, I'd I'd love to do that. It would be a special special occasion. I'm sure of it. And of course, Regina Mundi is not only the main Catholic cathedral within Soweto, but is the place where Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton got married during their visit to South Africa. I think that was their third mm. time the two of them have had gotten married. Tim, I know you're a man of facts. Can you verify that fact for me? <laughs> I cannot. I have no idea. I didn't, I didn't realize it. It sounds very exciting. <laughs> well, Tim, we're busy discussing where everyone was on the 27th of April, 1994. So I'm gonna ask you and Benji those questions as well. Tim, where were you? Where did you vote and what was it like? Uh, I voted in um, uh, in um, Cape Town um, the uh, at the uh, at the community centre in um, in Fushuk. 
No, not in Fushik, in um, Camps Bay. And were no. there long queues? Describe to us that day and that feeling of exhilaration when you got to put your, your cross on the ballot for the first time. And welcome, Rob, as well. Rob, we're on pre-chat. We're going live at 8 o'clock, but there are already probably over a 1,000 people watching us on Zoom, on YouTube, and on Facebook. And if you are watching us, please tell us... Um, where, where you're watching from. And Randall Godden says that they actually got married in Botswana. So Randall, my, my recollection is that in fact, they got married at Regina Mundi and then went on honeymoon to Chobe in Botswana because I believe my parents stayed in the same suite as them in the Chobe Lodge in Botswana, which had its own swimming pool. That was quite a remarkable experience if I remember from my youth. Uh, okay, so that's, tell that's that's just, uh, you've just dropped a clanger there. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 Tim, tell us about making that cross for the first time in the democratic South Africa. Well, you know, it was, um, I mean, it was so exhausting. I was a journalist at the time. Uh, um, it was, uh, I just couldn't believe that it happened. I, I mean, it was just, um, uh, uh the the whole run up for journalists to the to the first election was uh i mean more than exhausting it was um uh, uh it was blistering blistering um and uh we still we still all used bleepers at the, you know those beeper things at the time and the beepers were going off every 5 minutes i mean you couldn't sleep it was just amazing uh i don't know i i, I you sort of uh, um, it was actually quite a quiet day. I remember. Remember, there were three days of voting, right? Um, so on the for the first um, election, and uh, the um, and it was just blissful because uh, the um, you know everything had stopped. Um, just the whole craziness had just stopped. Anyway, Rob, where did you vote? Were you in the country in 1994? Um. I was in America in 1994. But you could have gone to a South African embassy, if I remember and I correctly. Did, and I did. You, so, so did you watch a, a, a vote in Washington, D.C.? No, I voted in New York. I voted in New York, in New York, York. At, the, yeah. at the consulate in New yeah. York. I lined up and put my cross and off we went. Well, Benji Porter, I don't want to guess your age, but were you old enough to vote 28 years ago? Oh, yeah, I was, Howie. It's very, uh, it's very good of you to think that I might not have. Um, but uh, the funny, I, I've told you the story before, is on voting day, we were training for Comrade. And we, uh, we thought that like a whole group of us would be very bright. And we would run, like do our long training run, and we'd go voting station to voting station. And we were like all full of the spirit and shouting, uh, you know, Amanda, and we were really like, it was a wonderful, wonderful day. But when we got to the third voting station, and I remember Rory Stain and, and all of us discussed this, they, we had been radioed in as potential problems. And uh, uh, this group of policemen came around us to, to whether we had to explain, we just on a training run and we just excited. But we voted, I voted at the Kez school. And I was, I was government schooled, as you know, and we are matriculated in the first group of uh, um, diverse matriculants and voted with some of my friends. And I could see what it meant to them and to their families. And it was a beautiful day. In fact, today in our call center, we were discussing it. And, and you know, it was very hopeful and very beautiful. So, uh, I, very importantly, Musi, we were joined by a member of your family. Danny, you've got a, a, um, a ballot paper on. I'll either take it off so we can see the people who swap the picture. Oh, but, I but... threatened to show this picture of you. Sorry, I was waiting for you to move on with the discussion. So, I just had to show this before we move on because this webinar will not be complete without discussing this picture, Howard. I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I, I I think I think I'm a, the man on the right that looks a little like Bantu Holomisa. <laughs> so, so Danny, Danny, that's not election day. That's in fact in Brussels in Chateau de la Hoop in 1992 when I took Mandela to to uh, meet European Union ambassadors and business people in Europe. And yes, I did at some point in time have hair. In case you're okay, wondering. I'm impressed. So, 
And that's black. Awesome. <laughs> There's I, more appropriate pictures. There we go. That's some nostalgia so, there. <laughs> so, so I I'm not going to mention an, uh, any names, but one of the IC commissioners who came from America, as Madiba voted, pushed everyone out of the way and ensconced herself next to Mandela in order to make sure that she was in the photograph of Mandela voting for the very first time. So I'm not going to mention names, but you see her in the photograph and she should definitely not have been in that picture at all. But there was a huge bun fart as she pushed everyone out of the way to make sure that she got a front page photo. There's, a, there's one that we were talking about earlier on, Howard. That's so, a beautiful, that's an iconic one right there. It's a very iconic picture. I've written an article in the Jewish Report this week because I used to be executive director of the Independent Electoral Commission, and I've written an article in the Jewish Report this week. And it explains some of these meandering lines because uh, no one had, in fact, counted black people in South Africa since the 1950s. So when it came to planning the 1994 election, we had no idea how many people would actually arrive to vote. We had no idea how many black people there were in the country, and we had no idea where they lived. And we therefore planned the elections based on South African breweries, beer distribution figures. And, sure. and where SAB sold a lot of beer, for example, in the center of Johannesburg, there was a polling station with six separate streams run by Dennis Fox, and no one arrived because no one at that point in time lived in the CBD of Johannesburg, even though a lot of beer was sold there. And in places like Davyton and Katlahong, and I think this picture that you're showing is in fact from Katlahong, uh, there was a queue at one point in time, 16 kilometers long. And one of my favorite stories of those elections was there was a 93 year old lady standing in the line all day. We had run out of ballot papers. We were trying to ship more ballot papers and voting equipment into the townships. And this 93 year old lady waited all day in the sun, waiting for more ballot papers to arrive. And the presiding officer said, Ma, go home, we'll call you when the, the ballot papers arrive. And she said, I've waited 93 years. Sure. I can wait a little longer. And, and that was the true spirit of, uh, of South Africa in 1994 and how we wish we could regain that spirit again. Sure. But, but Danny, you flipped another picture on. I think this is 1994. Uh, no. I had it. <laughs> this is a crime, if ever there is one. <laughs> Mussi, I saw that little person came to join you a few moments ago. Uh, that person looks a little like this. A little bit, a little bit, a little. Uh, that's my youngest daughter. She's two and a bit years old, so she came to say good night to me. But uh, this is the young me. Uh, I'd never, if I saw this young boy ever in the streets, would I say to him, you will go join politics and all of that. And yet the school seemed to think that that's what I was always going to do. But I never thought that's what I'd be doing. So I'm fascinated to see this little boy. I guess I have to say to him, it's going to be okay. <laughs> It'll be rough and bumpy at times, but it's going to be okay. <laughs> Yeah. Fantastic. Danny, do you have any more pictures to show us as uh, people join us? And this just to everyone nice. who's joining yeah. us, if you can't get onto the Zoom, we've only got a thousand logins on Zoom, which is about two and a half thousand people. If you do have friends and family who are attempting to join us and they can't get onto Zoom, please send them over to our YouTube link as well, because we have unlimited numbers of people that uh, that we can accommodate on, on Zoom. And if you're watching us all over the world, please just tell us where you are. Just before we continue, just to say hello to a few people. For example, Denise is watching from Boromwood in the UK. Randall and Elsa are in, in Mossel Bay. Um, uh, Selwyn is in Chile, Toronto. Uh, Estelle is, says she's looking forward to this evening. Uh, Lauren is in Connecticut. Linda is in California. Rene is in Sydney. We we hi from Bern in Cape Town. Gary and Renana in Israel. Uh, Michelle is in Boston. Um, Freddie is in Centurion, Miriam is in Seapoint, Lisa is in Cape Town, Morris is in Cape Town, Charlotte is in the Netherlands, Glenn Osher is 
sending us a long message, but I'm not quite sure where you are in the world. So a huge welcome to all of you around the world as we go through. I see see Martin is watching us from London and Sanding is in Savannah, Georgia, uh, uh, Georgia, and Jonathan is in darkness, he tells us. And probably that's one of the discussions uh, is watching. And, and uh, Sadi and Candace are watching us in Kil Kilbourne. And we have in London as well. We have Lou and Rose watching us in London as well, as people tell us around the world. So, Danny, do yes. we recognize any other people in that picture? Let's have a quiz. That's a quiz. Recognize the politician. Throw back to 1994. Can anyone recognize some of these that's, individuals? That's <laughs> a very young and thin Cyril. But uh, yes. I, I can't help thinking, Musi, that we've probably melted the mayoral chains down and uh, exported them to Dubai. <laughs> I'm looking at that picture and wondering uh, who, what if history could foretell what was coming after this. But anyway. well, Mosi, he has another one. Talk about uh, foretelling history <laughs> and throw back 1994. <laughs> you, you know, you know, I was thinking about KZN and thinking about the broader context within violence, and I just thought. You know, the most one of the more historic speeches Nelson Mandela delivered was the throw away your gun speech, right? And when you think about violent crime today and the state of crime, you kind of wonder whether the reversal isn't happening, where people are starting to recoup guns and trying to, we have a real gun and murder problem. So when I look at this, sometimes you think to yourself, there was a stage in our country where we had optimism and despite the difficulties we kind of thought we would head in the right direction and when i look at how you know history is a funny way of retelling itself so i'm looking at this sometimes with mixed emotions of hope and despair and all of the above you know well, I'm busy looking at Rod Persov who looks just lovely by candlelight it looks like Rob <laughs> have you just gone into load shedding yes i've just been anc load shedded so Thank i you. i don't I don't, know if you noticed, I, I don't know if you've noticed, Tim, but yesterday the Johannesburg Roads Agency asked us two things. They asked us to please stop filling up our own potholes. And they've asked us please to stop defacing all the potholes on our roads by spray painting ANC next to all of the potholes. Well, I think you should uh, turn that request down and, uh, uh, you know, brand the potholes, you know, to, uh, uh, if you fix them, you know, put the, uh, um, use it as an opportunity, put the, you know, Jewish report, get it here. <laughs> <laughs> Very much. Uh, I see Giddy Shimoni has joined us and uh, Giddy, I presume you're joining us from Jerusalem, one of the great historians of our community. Haven't seen you in years, but so fantastic to have you on this evening. So a big welcome to everyone around the world. The time has just gone 8 p.m. And today, believe it or not, is our 150th webinar that we've run since COVID began. So Benji, it's our birthday. Do you remember that first moment? I think it was about the 26th of, um, of March 2000 when we said, let's try to do something to help our community. At that point in time, no one had ever heard of Zoom. No one had ever heard of a webinar. And we decided to bring some doctors on just to give people some advice on how to cope with COVID, which were followed by psychologists on the long haul of COVID and nutritionists and exercise people. Benji, did you ever imagine at that point in time, 150 webinars later, more than 3 million views? Uh, Howie, absolutely not. And it's like completely, uh, it's, 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 it's really amazing. I remember that first webinar, people were WhatsApping me saying, can you see me? They were worried with the webinar that people could like see them. And, and we've come a long way. And what's remarkable about our community is that they've supported some of the stuff they're interested, some of the stuff they aren't so interested, but we've had this incredible support. And, uh, and, and Howie, as I've, I've said a number of times, driven by you with your leadership, it's been remarkable. And it's been an absolute privilege to be part of. I don't know how you feel about it, but it's, it's really been one of the most remarkable things I've ever been involved in. And I think we've gone, we've gone from mere helping people to great storytelling. And I think South Africa has so many remarkable stories to tell. So for those of you who haven't watched the, them all, to some of our guests, we did one, one of our most popular ones of all time on Sylvia, the Mossad spy from South Africa, uh, a story that had never really been told 
before. We did the Lady in Gold and the restitution of artworks from the Nazis. We had South Africa's most successful ever drug dealer caught with 70 tons of hash uh, as he tried to smuggle it into Can Canada. Uh, we had Greg Blank recently. Tim, I don't know if you saw the webinar we did with Greg Bank Blank and Rail Levitt talking about how do you bounce back from scandal. And we've had Bill Browder on a number of times talking about his ongoing battle with uh, with Vladimir Putin. And one of my favorites is ISIS and ISIS operations in South Africa. Benji, Danny, I don't know if you have any favorites you want to talk about just before we start the webinar. Um, how we are, I absolutely loved uh, Wade van Nieke describing his Olympic run to us online. It was something quite remarkable. And then to see uh, 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 on, on Freedom Day, and I think you'll, 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 um, you'll remember this moment when um, we were warned about the, uh, the, the vaccines by a remarkable South African. Do you remember, Howie, and how vaccine distribution needs to be in a moral way? About, a, about seven months before the whole vaccine rollout, where, where it was so difficult to get uh, vaccines initially. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think that if I had to say it was Wade van Nikkek describing the mating Olympic record run, that would be my favorite. Danny, tell us your favorite quickly. Do you remember when we got Andre Dorator on back in the I, I, good old days when we were still bemoaning the fact that we had load shedding, never mind stage six? <laughs> yeah, those, those were the good old days. Little those were the night. glory days. <laughs> Bring them back. <laughs> well, well, a huge thank you to all three million times that people have watched us around the world. It's been such an honor and a privilege on behalf of the SA Juice Report to bring this service really to people in South Africa and people around the world. So thank you for joining us. Just a quick reminder that the latest edition of the Juice Report is out. It celebrates 75 years of Israel independence. It's out. It's an amazing read. It's 20 pages of just feel good magic. So go out and either get your copy at Pick and Pay or Exclusive Books or Discam or Checkers or your local spaza shop or your garage shop or your shul or your uh, school or your butchery. We're distributed free of charge in about 242 locations around South Africa. And if you prefer to read it online, don't forget sajr.co.za. You can either Go and download the entire edition all at one go, or alternatively, you can look at each of the individual articles online there, there as well. So don't forget, our webinars are all on YouTube, or alternatively, you can go onto our website, click on webinar, and you'll be able to watch us there as well. The print edition this week will only be out on Friday because of uh, the public holiday tomorrow. And a quick reminder as well, if you are watching us on YouTube, please go click the like and subscribe button. That really helps us notify you when we have new, new webinars coming out. So please, if you are watching us on YouTube, please go click the like and subscribe button. That's really in your advantage and our advantage as well. Danny's on control this, this evening. This is not a monologue. This is very much a discussion. And we want you to be participating in this discussion as well. So if you're on Facebook or on YouTube, please put any comments you have or questions you have in, in the questions or comments section. And Benji and Danny will be bringing all of those questions across to Zoom. If you're watching us on Zoom, don't forget there's a QA and a button and there's a comment section as well. We want to make sure that you're part of this conversation as well. And most importantly, of all of, all of these things, this is casual, this is informal, but it is an honest and frank discussion. So a huge thank you to Danny, he's on controls. A thank you to Benji, who will be dealing with many of your questions. And Tim, we're actually going to start today. Freedom Day is tomorrow. When you think back on the last 28 years of South African freedom, independence, liberation, should we be satisfied with where we are or is it a world of lost opportunities? Uh, um, Howard, I, I think that question slightly answers itself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, you know, I mean, it's uh, 
I mean, I do look back on that day with uh, with fantastic fondness and everything. I, I mean, it is an extraordinary situation for those of us who are old enough to remember what what life was like during apartheid. Trust me, this is better. You know, even with the load shedding and everything else, I'm so de- I'm been so delighted to have spent most of my life living in a democracy. It is fantastic. It sort of goes without saying. The um, but uh, but but you know the the the. The, the trajectory of South Africa is extremely obvious. It has it got better and better and better from 94 to around about 2008. And from 2008, it got worse and worse and worse. And we are in a, I, what this friend of mine, uh, uh, I was yeah, I was chatting about history as one does. And he said, uh, he, he, uh, he had this quote that's just like stuck in my mind now. It was actually from a, a Viennese writer called Karl Krauss. And he, and he was reflecting on the situation. This is like the, the turn of the 19th century or the 20th century, right? So 1910 or something around there. And he said, the situation in Berlin is serious, but not hopeless. The situation in Vienna is hopeless, but not serious. So now I'm trying to work out myself, which one of those two we are. Are we serious, but not hopeless? Or are we hopeless, but not serious? It's one of the two, maybe a little bit of both. <laughs> So, Tim, people, of course, know you because you're the business editor of the Daily Maverick, but you've got a long history in journalism in this country. Give us a 30-second version of where you've come from. Um, well, I, I, I started off as a political writer. I wrote about politics for quite a long time, and then I swapped to writing about business um, and uh, uh, sp- spent basically most of my career with Business Day. Um, I was the editor of the Financial Mail and, and of Business Day eventually. Um, and I've just recently swapped to, uh, to be the business editor of the Daily Maverick. So we can say some of that maybe grey white hair is well deserved and well homed over the last uh, few decades. Yes, yeah, there's one, I have to make one admission, and that is that uh, despite my surname, I'm not in fact Jewish. Uh, so uh, I'm one of those real oddities. Uh, so the, the uh, um, uh, I, I'm just going to work on the basis that, that I, I, I got the invitation to this discussion on the basis of merit, not on the you, basis of my... my well, uh, uh, Tim, I don't know how to tell you this, but Benji's got enough and you can be circumcised by the end of tonight. <laughs> a, a lot of my Jewish friends say... That, that is not my <laughs> skill. <I> mean, <laughs> a lot of my Jewish friends say that if you're a current, you, you don't have a choice. You are Jewish. So uh, <laughs> maybe that's the situation. So, Rob Hersov, your family have a long, long history in South Africa. In fact, your grandfather was one of the great mining landlords. Tell us about the Hersovs and the Manel family. So, uh, Bob Hersov, my grandfather, who died at a, at a young age of 58, um, and my father, Basil, who I had dinner with two nights ago in Johannesburg, and my mother, Antoinette, is a ripe, he's turning 97 this year, and she's turning 90. It's quite extraordinary. And they live in Johannesburg in the house that I was born in. Um, Bob Hersov and his friend Slip Menel founded Anglo Val. And uh, Bob was one of four sons. And he was the only one they could afford to send to university. He did mining engineering at Witz. And he had, he was an extraordinary businessman. And his friend Slip Menel was a stockbroker. And the two of them together built Anglo Val, which in its heyday, which I guess was, you say, it was the 70s and 80s, you know, owned Anglovol Mining, which is now African Rainbow Minerals, and Anglovol Industries, which still exists as AVI, but it was a much broader business. And it was in, owned Consul Glass, Anglo Alpha, Baker's Biscuits, Five Roses, INJ. I can go on and on for hours. It was one of the great mining industrial businesses of Southern Africa. And I was born into that family in 1960 in Johannesburg. So <laughs> lucky me. Um, and on my father's side, there's there's the Jewish heritage. My mum isn't Jewish. And so I've been brought up and not as a Jew, but I have a great, um, um, I'm becoming more and more Jewish, let's say, as I get older. I'm reaching out, finding my Jewish roots. Watch out for that knife. <laughs> oh, no, that's been done already. I'm happy to say. <laughs> Too much information, Rob. Done already. <laughs> but Rob, where have you been? Because you didn't have a public profile until a year or two ago. And then suddenly you burst onto the scene with some highly opinionated views. What, was this a late awakening to politics? Tell us what that, that, that tipping point was that brought you in as a very vocal critic of our current government. Yeah, so I, I, after, I did University of Cape Town two years in the army. And then in 1985, I left the country. 
And I spent 31 years overseas, six years in the United States and 25 years in Europe, but mainly in London. And I did Harvard Business School, Goldman Sachs. I worked for Rupert Murdoch for, for a number of years as his right hand. And then, then I joined Johan Rupert with Richemont in Europe and in, in 99 became an entrepreneur and had failure and success. And, you know, 31 years abroad. And I woke up one day and just said to my wife, um, you know, I want to go home. I want to go back to South Africa. And at that time, Jacob Zuma was in charge. And I said to her, I think South Africa has about two to three years left before it really falls into the abyss. It's being mismanaged. It's being stolen to death. And all elements of democracy have been compromised, except, except and this is at the time we came back, except for the media, the judiciary, and the treasury and finance. Well, within months of getting back, you know, the treasury and finance were definitely compromised. And my wife said, well, why are we only going back for two to three years? And I said, well, under Zuma, it's over. It's finished. He will destroy the country. The ANC, incompetent, kleptocrats, ineptocrats. The game is over. It's heading down a cliff. And I had reckoned about 20% of judiciary was compromised at that point, where judges would make decisions that would just go the way the ANC wanted them to go. I still believe it's 20, 30% even today. The media can be turned off overnight. And, you know, the, and, you know, treasury and finance were compromised. And then Cyril got elected. And my wife said, well, what does that mean? I said, we've just kicked the can down the road. There's going to be civil unrest and the ANC will destroy the economy. Um, you know, we've got maybe five years. And then I met Musi and others and uh, built up a strong friendship and a great admiration with of Moosey. When he came to London for the DA, I met him. And then I met him again back in South Africa. And I just started to meet more and more and more people. And I started to get angrier and angrier. And I remember a friend of mine, Marius Barnett, who's married to Vin Immerman's daughter. When I came back to South Africa, said, Rob, let me give you the best advice of all. Keep your head down, focus on business, make money, don't get involved in politics. <laughs> and I told my wife, you know, I'm not going to get involved in politics, but I'm not going to invest in anything that has a long time frame or doesn't have revenues that can be externalized immediately or the potential to generate international hard currency. Well, I broke those all those rules very quickly. And the political rule I broke because one day, about two years in, you know, reading Daily Maverick, reading all these different newspapers, my wife threw a paper down and said, these ANC idiots are destroying this country. Why don't you do something about it? And I went, okay, I will. And that was it. And it was really two years ago, I stood up and made a speech at a business conference to, to 100 people. And it went viral. I called, you know, I said, if anyone's still voting ANC, they're a moron. I then defined what a moron meant, adult with a mental age of eight to 12. And I just, you know, once I was gone, I was gone. This thing you know, it went viral and there was, it was, there was no pulling back. I'm not sure I'm Daily Maverick's favorite. Maybe Tim can change that from the business perspective. Um, you know, they're a bit too left wing for me when it comes to certain elements, but I do admire them for what they do. I really do. And my so, so Rob, I'm not in politics, but I'm actually, I've become an activist. I've never, never knew I'd be called that. Moosey called once when I was helping him on one essay, he said, you're one of my chief activists. I said, I've never been called an activist in my life. Maybe I'm a capitalist activist. So Rob, the one thing we've learned about you tonight is you listen to your wife. I do listen to my wife. She's a New Zealander. She's a doctor. She's certainly more mature than I am and <laughs> probably more intelligent than I am. So, Musi Maimani, let's ask the same question. Where have you gone? You were leader of the Democratic Alliance until 2019. You had a huge public profile, and then you disappeared from all of our screens and our newsprint. Where have you been in the last four years? My goodness. Uh, good evening, Howie, and great to see everyone. I honestly have had the best and the worst four years in the recent while, starting with a very painful departure away from the DA. Uh, it was very difficult to, to leave. And I left, you know, in many ways out of principle to try and say, I genuinely believe in a South Africa that works for everybody uh, and that can bring races black and white together for a prosperous nation. So as idealistic as that is, I, I left to try and go 
if I couldn't give expression to that, I need to go find it out. So I spent a couple of months in um, traveling and then I went to Edinburgh for a, for a month. I can remember in, in the October of 2019, touring whiskey distilleries. I still can't remember much about that tour. And then I came back to South Africa. And of course, in that time, I realized a few things, that democracy had distanced itself from people. So we founded One South Africa with the chief purpose of really fighting to amend the Electoral Act. I knew when I was a member of parliament that um, whilst I'd, I'd had a master's in economics, I knew very little about how to run an actual business. So I got involved in business for the last number of years. And furthermore, I then proceeded to say, if we're going to get this country right, how do we empower communities to do so? So I spent three years really traveling to rural parts of South Africa, identifying great South Africans to represent their communities. And so maybe not being publicly active on the screens, but come really in communities. And then towards the end of last year, in September, we founded Build One South Africa, a political party to say, given the infrastructure we built, given the three years of uh, to use to a fairly uh, synonymous period of the wilderness, given we've just gone through Pesach, given through all of that and having to really dig deep and say, what do we need to do for this country? I then felt strongly to come back and say, how do we serve and how do we continue that fight for the South Africa that works for all? So, so I still carry on the fight in many ways and I feel now I'm back in a better frame, having known both victory and defeat, but back to fight a, a stronger battle. So does that mean you're back in the elections which are scheduled April, May, June next year? Yeah, May 2024, you will have Build One South Africa on the ballot. Uh, we're standing for elections. We're standing really for those two things. How do we build a country where there are jobs in every home? And how do we ensure that there's one South Africa, regardless of race, religion, uh, gender? How do we bring South Africans together in a global universe that's polarizing? So um, to tell you the truth, Howie, I'm having the best time of my life. I've never been more animated. So when I listen to the state of the nation, at some level, I might think about it in a despairing way. But at another level, I've never been more animated about South Africa. I actually think we live in an amazing country. I, think, I happen to think that the prospects of this country are great. And if the only problem we have to deal with are the politics of our country, well, heck, to Tim's earlier analysis, we're not hopeless. We certainly are serious, but we're certainly not hopeless because if that's the only, if that's a, one of the key fundamental obstacles to overcome, those are easily done relative to what's going on perhaps in other parts of the world where there are, there are wars continuously or natural disasters. So to me, I feel that we are, to, to, I remember when President Nelson Mandela, you remember that period when he was in hospital, we used to say critical but stable. So I feel like that's where we are. And I must be honest, I have never felt more animated for the fight than I do now. So I want to ask the unfair question, if I may, because mm. there was a very public spat between you and Helen Zilla. Yeah. Ultimately, it resulted in your departure from the DA. But we, we move with a democratic alliance with black leadership, some a, a party who could appeal to a broad sector of South Africa. And with your departure, the DA has become very much, at least in leadership, a white dominated party. Yeah. What happened between you and Helen? Well, I mean, firstly, I, I have respect for Helen. Right? I, I, I worked with her for so many years um, both when I was national spokesperson and then uh, deputy chairperson of the party, I worked with them when she was leader of the party. And so I feel like there was a before period and then I took over the leadership of the party and off she went off to Singapore. And when she came back, I feel like it introduced a different chapter in our relationship. And the distinctions were as follows. Uh, I felt I'd met someone who understood the complexities and the pain of what was going on in the country. And I thought in her return, given the posts about colonialism, given all of that, I embarked into, I met someone who suddenly felt a very strong need to defend a particular racial group of South Africans, which I sought to challenge that issue 
fundamentally within the DA is saying, look, guys, if we're going to win as an organization, we have to have an appeal that speaks to all South Africans. Now, you are going, when you go for that route, you are going to have fallouts on either end. You are going to have particularly some white African South Africans who may feel this is not a home for them anymore. And you may feel extremist left black South Africans who might sit on one end and say, this is not for us. And so you are going to face that challenge. But the, the middle road, the South Africans of a diverse race actually want to work together and actually want to go together. And so in 2019, when all of those uh, those groups moved off, I thought that we maybe were trimmed the hedge sufficiently to have healthy growth going forward to be the party that would dominate, take, take Mandela's vision, take the economic pain that South Africa is going and bring it forward. And what happened in that period is that uh, a couple of things started to actually happen. You, you had a scenario where there were others who felt that they needed to go back to a place where you consolidate minorities, a sort of fight back kind of campaign. And I thought I wasn't going to be a part of that. There was a strong pushback to say, we need to go back to fetch those Afrikaans voters who had left and focus exclusively on those. I said, I couldn't do that. It just wasn't going to be the, for the health of the long-term organizations. There's nothing wrong with the Freedom Front Plus that the people vote for it. And thirdly, because we'd managed to get such popular sway, you had a number of politicians within the organization who, if I'm, if I'm brutally honest, made, made my waking up every day a living hell. It just became painful to go to work and fight for a country. And so given those, given just the state of, as I said earlier, given the state of where you want to be as a husband, a father to kids and and serving in an organization, it just couldn't be that way. And, and, I, and I really want the DA to succeed. So I'm not coming out of a place of bitterness. It's taken me a number of years to try and get through that. But the fights became personal and the fights became about arm wrestling for donor bases, et cetera, et cetera. And I felt to stay and fight, it would stop being a fight about the principle of non-racialism or how you see it. It would become a fight about black versus white. And that is certainly the antithesis of what I stand for, because I've always thought it's black and white rather than the other way around. So, so I knew the fight would be the distraction of South Africa. And ultimately, not only of the DA, the implications would mean that, and, and I still hold it to be true. If you set an organization to be of a particular minority or of a particular racial group, you set that entire group up to either be targeted for victimhood or to be victimizers. And I think that's not the place South Africa ought to go. So I felt it was important to leave. It was tough. I left literally without a salary. I knew I left without anything. I said, I'm going to charter this path because I genuinely believe in it. And off I went on, a, on an extended journey. So, so if I saw Helen the other day at a function, and maybe sometimes things are still a little bit raw and uncomfortable, and I felt that that whole animus of trying to divide South Africans on the basis of race. But I still maintain, she sat across the room for me and we wanted to have a conversation. I'm more than open for it because I think I love South Africa more than I love any party. And I'm not saying that to sound preachy. I say that as a sincere South African who genuinely wants to see the best for this country. So Tim, let's start with the question before we look at solutions. Let's start with the question where all of this went wrong. Is it an issue of leadership? Is it an issue of one political party? How did we, as a country, go off the rails? Wow, uh, that's that's an easy question. Uh, uh, um, the um, uh, you know, I think I think we you know with um, with a uh, with the, the crisis that South Africa's in, it's pretty obvious that there were a, a number of different factors that uh, that sort of com compounded with it on, you know, on top of one another. Um, I, you, you know, if you trace the history of, of, uh, of South Africa's economy, um, you know, everything was improving, as I was saying, to around about 2008, 2009, and then it all started turning around. Um, and I th that, that, you know, that was a kind of pivotal moment for not only for South Africa, but for the globe, of course, because um, that was the time of the financial crisis. Um, and for some reason or other, South Africa didn't bounce back from the, from the global financial crisis in the way that the rest of the world did. Um, and I think that has to do with two things. 
The one is that uh, the, the emerging market countries of, were, were the, the vulnerabilities of emerging market countries were, were uh, um, sort of brought to the fore. And also the commodity um, crisis, uh, the commodity boom ended at that point. Uh, so those were two sort of marks in um, uh, uh, sort of against us. But I think the most important thing was that even though the ANC sort of continued right through the process, inside of the ANC, there were uh, uh, really fundamental changes took place in the, in, the, in the nature of the organization. The EFF had broken away. The, the, uh, um, for the first time, the ANC was almost constantly looking to its left rather than to its right. Uh, um, the, uh, the whole, the, the, the leadership of the party uh, sort of ousted the, 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 all of the kind of Mbeki middle of the roaders um, and, and the, the core of the party became much more left wing. Um, and, uh, and of course, the, the, it was at that point that really sort of corruption really got hold of the ANC and, uh, and penetrated it really thoroughly. Um, so, you know, the, the, I mean, this is just a brief sketch, but, you know, there's plenty of other things too. Um, I, I also think that there was... Um, you know, the, 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 the more that the ANC lost power or, or lost support, it wasn't losing support hand over fist, but it was, you know, definitely on the road downwards, the more desperate people within the party became and the more wedded they became to the policies that really just weren't working. So, you know, they, 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 their, their interpretation for why, for example, the, you know, the mining charter, you know, the mining charter has been a disaster for South African mining. South African mine, you know, used to be, you know, 50% of the world's gold production. It's now 5%. Yeah. Uh, um, so, you know, the, uh, uh, all, all of those sorts of things, even though the, uh, concretely the, the economic situation was turning against them, the, the ANC couldn't find it within itself to reform and to pivot. Um, the um, does that is the, do, you, do you think I'm going sort of more or less in the right direction? I, but I, but you I, know, it's more than I think. I, think I, I just want to question one one thing, and that's you say the ANC moved to the left, but did yeah. it move ideologically, or did it just move from a government ra rather than a government into a business? No, I th well, you know, there was there's uh, um, the, I think that what happened was that the ANC factionalized. Um, and that there was a, uh, you know, there was a left-wing lobby within the organization. There was a, a, a stalwarts lobby within the organization. And there was a get rich quick uh, um, faction within the organization, if you want to put it simplistically. Um, and those three organizations, actually, the fact that there was, uh, that it split into this kind of factional sort of grouping made it worse because that, uh, that helped to, uh, 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 to, to, from a, to, to make it a kind of immovable from a policy point of view. Um, you know, it's just incredible how, how the, you know, the, 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 the policy ideas that the ANC came up with in the 90s, you know, have remained on the statute books almost unchanged. You know, the, uh, the debates that we were having then you know, uh, there's some changes, obviously, but generally speaking, you know, they you kind know, of more or less the same. The, uh, um, and and I think that's because you know an organization which is so riven as the ANC and has so many tendencies pulling in so many different directions, it makes it very difficult to uh, you know to to bring to to um, to implement a coherent uh, um, uh, policy direction. Um, the um, yeah, I mean, I, I the, the there's more to it than that. I, I mean, I the, the, the um, uh, uh, so some of it has to do with personalities. I think there's a you know another factor is that uh, you know the, the 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 private sector in South Africa, you know, I, I find very uh, um, cowed and uh, um, and subservient. Uh, they don't argue their points very well. They have. Uh, uh, um, you know, there's, uh, you know, odd, uh, odd people here and there, you know, uh, uh, do, do, uh, you know, speak with in a forthright way, but a lot of them don't. Um, so, uh, you know, we've been caught in a bit of a loop, I would say, in a, in a kind of uh, sort of perpetual uh, uh, and increasing uh, a downward spiral economically. Um, 
which so is I see, uh, I, see, I see Rob nodding his head when you talk about the fact that the business community has been very mute. So given the fact that Rob has been very vocal, I want to start with him and then move to Musi. Rob, select for me the three biggest issues that we have to address as a nation, maybe in order of priority. I'm going to ask both yourself and, and Musi that question. What do we have to tackle first if we were to, to leave all the nonsense aside? Where would you put your priorities? So the three ele electoral issues, the three electoral issues, the most important of all, jobs, tough on crime, and get the economy working, which is a bit of a catch-all for load shedding, you know, electricity so kids can be educated. It catches everything else. But jobs is first, tough on crime is second, and pretty much everything else follows from there. And it's so blatantly clear that those are the most important things of all. Simple. And the problem is we have ineptocrats and kleptocrats in power. That's it. There isn't a single person in the cabinet that is a competent A-class person. I have a friendship with Enoch Gonagwana, the finance minister is a decent guy. The rest are just idiots and clowns. And they are running this country. And to Tim's point, and what a pleasure to hear someone from Daily Maverick say it, you know, our business community are cowards and colluders in the main, other than a handful of brave people like Alan Pullinger, Neil Froneman, Raul Koza. Um, I can just name them on one hand. The rest, you know, silence of the lambs. Tell <laughs> us very quickly what you thought of Andre de Reiter's performance today when he appeared before Parliament. We didn't name names. He should have said it was Pravin Gordon and David Mabuza, you know, or whoever the two were. I suspect it's those two clowns. And he didn't. So, you know, we've lost a huge opportunity there to pinpoint the people that are the bad guys. Frankly, they all are, but some are way worse than others. Five months ago, I was on SABC. I was shocked they even asked me to be on SABC. <clears throat> and, and usually it's a five minute segment, but the lady interviewed me for 20 minutes and then did four minutes, four or five minute segments. And I said, five minutes, five hours, five months ago. The, uh, the SCOM is run by the mafia, and I named the different mafias that are doing it. That, you know, some crazy businessman, no one listens to me. But when Andre de Reiter said it and got poisoned for the, for, the, <laughs> for the kindness of actually doing it, people started to listen. But do you remember the Zonda Commission? Feels like 100 years ago. What's happened as a result of that? Nada. Nothing. Cyril just laughs at us. So, Musi, tell us your three priorities. Is Rob right? Is jobs number one? Does electric electricity not feature other than in terms of economic growth? Look, uh, I mean, we've organized our stall by saying, if you were to say, what's our mega as build one South Africa, I'd say, we've got to put a job in every home. That, that's the job. And why that's an important message? Because in truth, I hold our biggest crisis as a country is that we live if you like, in the South Africa for the employed and the South Africa for the unemployed. Others define it as formal, informal, whatever the language you use. The fact is, the remnant of apartheid still sits in our society in the sense that if, if you look at crime and how it affects all of us, but pernicious even more so around the criminal justice system amongst poor people, you can appreciate that when 67 people are murdered every single day and you can be assured you know where they're from and you know that the conviction rate behind that is less than 20 percent you can appreciate that our criminal justice system is simply incapable of responding to the real issue around crime it's the fact that 20 percent of our kids go to very good schools and and they'll get through it they may be quintile five schools or a combination of private and ieb schools but 80 percent of the schools in this country are woefully dysfunctional in that before if a million kids start today 40 percent of them would have dropped out before they even get to matric so to me that's our organizing thing is that if you then think about putting a job in every home having a job in a home does mean for that family that in some ways they, like anyone else, can exercise the most primary right, which is the right to choose. You can choose where, what, what you eat, where you live, what kind of security you have, all of those things, the right to choose. And I, to me, I want to, that's what I'm trying to organize this country around, is to say everything that we do, 
every piece of legislation we pass must be to respond to that question of jobs. Because when we've got it in that manner, we can then say, actually, is it okay that our kids pass at 30%? No, it's not. Let's focus on STEAM subjects and make sure they pass at 50%. That's a policy position. If you say to me, is it okay that women can walk around and not feel safe in the middle of the night? No one is going to invest or no one is going to come and tour a country where they feel unsafe. We could be increasing our tourism sector quite significantly. You know, when I think about the extent of crime, the, the other crucial area, along with low chedi, but it's the logistics and the ports. It costs, I was speaking to a business person today. They say it costs them more to move something for a, a container from Durban to Johannesburg than it would from China to Durban. Now, how is that logistically a workable solution as we sit at this point? We need to fix our logistics so that we can ensure that our import exports are working well. So to me, the, 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 my biggest critique of the ANC isn't just that they are corrupt, is that they've got a vision for yesterday. And, and, and they would tell you today that the reason for existence is to try and fix apartheid. And I'm going, hold on, we've got a crisis that to fix, we've got to really charter a future. We've got to tell our kids, how are you going to learn digitally? Can we fix the fact that people can come down and be safe in our communities? Can we ensure that healthcare is a basic right for everybody? So when I table a 10 point plan, I'm not doing it because it sounds nice. And I, when I wrote back even to all parties that want to talk about coalitions, I did so because I said, here is, here is Bossa's mega, which is the big vision, put a job in every home. And here are 10 points that we will go to war for, regardless of where you put us in government. So I'm going to ask each of the panelists, starting with you, Mussi, what's the solution? Because Stephen says he's 75 years old. He's not sure he'll be around to solve some of these problems unless we get cracking immediately. So give us your one thing. I'm going to go, going to go ask each of you. Well, give us the one thing that you can do. If you had the magic wand of presidency, what would be the first thing that you would do to get it right? I mean, as, I, as I've been saying all along, if you fix our politics, our biggest dilemma that we face is that actually we've got an incapable state. It doesn't matter what you think of doing. If the state doesn't work, you're not going to get it right. And so to me, if you said to me, Musi Maimani, what's your first 100 days in government, given the vision you've got, given all of that, I build the best vehicle to get us there. I sometimes think we don't have a corruption problem. We've got a capability problem. It's when people are deployed to positions and they can pass out invoices, when the police are not able to just produce a, a, a proper docket so that you can get convictions. That's the incapability of state. So I would right size it, make sure it is effective. Uh, and then secondly, make sure that that state People must know that when we say a rule is a rule, a law is a law, we are going to implement it. Because at this point in time, to be honest with you, all of us sitting on this call and all the people listening, if I put you in a car, wherever you are in South Africa, and said drive through every traffic light from here to wherever you are going, I can, you can be assured no one is going to arrest you. That's Except a problem. Except in the Western Cape. Except in the Western Cape, Lucy. Come on. The, the, and yeah, I mean, so to me, car. at absolute core, Build the capability of the state so that you can deliver against a, a solid plan. If you f- fail at those two things, and the NC has destroyed the ability of the state and don't have a plan. So we have a double burst. But for me, that's what Build One South Africa is focused on doing. So Rob, let us say we handed that baton over to you, the baton of presidency. Tell us what your priority would be in either your first day or your first hundred days. One, privatize all state-owned enterprises. You know, you put them in the hands of corrupt and incompetent people. They're going to break. They're going to break them as they've done, and they're going to steal them blind as they are doing. Bang! Number one. Number two. Force federalization on South Africa as fast and as far as possible. Push decisions from the centre down to the provinces, down to the cities, down to the municipalities. Go take a look at Orania. I went there three weeks ago. It's a self-determined, well-organized state where you have to speak Afrikaans and have to be a Christian that runs itself. And they're reaching out to other tribal communities across South Africa, including Soweto, to say, 
The government brings you nothing. In fact, the government is an impediment to growth, an impediment to success. Make your own decisions, build your own life, create your own community based on values and principles. So I decentralize decision-making, decentralize power, and decentralize the tiller, the trough, as quickly as possible. And you can do this very quickly. So Tim, I, the one thing I've realized is problems are easy. Solutions are much more difficult. Do these guys have the correct solutions or is it all a pipe dream? Yeah, I differ. Um, I agree with in parts and differ in parts. I mean, I, you know, the, 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 actually, I don't think the solutions are that dif difficult. Uh, um, I think the problem is that South Africans try and pretend that the political system is their salvation. And the political system is not our salvation. Our salvation, every country has to make a, 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 a choice between providing uh, uh, social services and, and developing its economy. And what's happened in South Africa is, is an, an absolutely enormous amount of effort and has gone in. Some of it incredibly well-intentioned and, and some of it quite success, successful into providing more and more and more and more social services, right? Um, but but the, in the process, we've completely lost focus on what it takes to build a modern, capable, uh, uh, growing economy. That's the solution. The solution is not, it, it doesn't lie in the political kingdom. It lies in, in, uh, in, in developing, you know, the, 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 uh, the South African um, uh, 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 business sector, I mean, and you know, it's so crazy because we, it's, you know, we do have the capacity there. This is, it's not, uh, we've got a, a fantastically, we have a, uh, I mean, I'm always amazed that after all of this, after everything that South Africa has been through, stage six load shedding, uh, you know, Standard Bank could still come out with a, with a, uh, um, you know, a 25% increase in profits. You know, it's, uh, um, I mean, it's just amazing that they, you know, somehow there are some extremely capable people there who, who are, uh, who, who are finding solutions. I mean, I think that's where I disagree with Musi. You know, I, I find all South, South African politicians think that the problem is if they were in power, well, it would be different. Um, but it's not, it's not, that's, uh, that's not exactly right. It may be better, uh, but, uh, but the, the, the axis of our society has to shift. Um, now, I, is, I don't know if that's too broad or too simple. People are telling me to stop waffling. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> Tim, anyway, that's what I think. Tim, <laughs> is justice a requirement for us to move on? We've just seen, for example, the Gupta extradition declined. We've seen the first state capture case fall apart in the free state. Do we need justice in order to start again? Or yes, do we say, we... forget, no, no, forget no, no, about no, no, what's no, happened, no, no, let's no. build again? No, 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 no. The, the, justice is part of the solution. Um, justice has to be a, 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 is a sort of crucial component uh, because it, it depends whether you are, you are, and I think Musi would probably agree with me here, um, it, it, you have to have a society built on values. Um, th those values have to be, th have to run right through the society and have to unify the, the society and, uh, um, and justice is one of them. And not, not only justice, by the way, for the, you know, for, um, you know, for, for the sort of corruptees within the ANC of which there are plenty, but also justice in a broader sense. You know, we need to a fairer society. Um, we need to, we need, there's a, you know, there are, there are, uh, um, you know, an, an, an extraordinary number of people who, who haven't uh, um, been able to actualize their lives. Um, and, uh, uh, and that's, uh, that's critical. Um, yeah. So, so Musi, we're 14 months away from an election. What are the polls saying to us? Will our next election or our next government be everyone other than the ANC? potentially everyone's best case scenario or most people's best case scenario? Will it be the ANC and the EFF, everyone's worst case scenario? Or are there versions of grey between those two? Well, let me, I, I know Tim says that politicians self-diagnose the problem and think they're the solution. But in this instance, I want to be adamant and say this. If we keep the current government in play without any challenge, be rest assured, nothing is going to change except it will get worse. So 
I think we mustn't, we mustn't take this moment lightly. It's a vital moment. And secondly, I think actually politicians are a lot like nappies, as someone says. Once they fall, they need to be changed. And I think that's what's going on in part. So to the question at hand, which is what 2024 looks like, Polling-wise, I think the NC will drop will, will dip below uh, 50%. Given the lack of electricity and energy and young people entering the market, we've been working very hard. I'm comfortable enough to say, even on this webinar, what we're working on. My job is to wake up every morning to beat the EFF. And the reason I say that is because you need four parties to sit around the table come 2024. The NC must bring its own voter set. The EFF will bring its own voter set. The DA must, and we must. And whatever happens in the sense that if the only option the ANC has is to just merge with the EFF to get over 50, well, be assured this country will be even in deeper trouble because there is very limited policy difference between the ANC in some ways. And I sometimes think to myself, the, the EFF is just the ANC and drag, if I could put it in that way. So what we have to achieve is a different configuration of a government come 2024. And I, the best service we can give this country is to make sure we put an option on the table that is bigger than the EFF. That way, all decisions must be counterweighted on that balance. So polling-wise, we're comfortable enough. We've just finished an international poll. It indicates that we'll get just a bit of, uh, above a double digit pending on, pending on an election and how we go. So that's what we're working on. It shows the DA will hold its support. It shows the ANC will decline. And it indicates the fact that the EFF has hit its ceiling. So I'm, I'm, I'm not looking to split the opposition vote. I'm not trying to do that at all. I'm trying to make sure that the 5 million voters who are understanding and sympathetic of the ANC and are looking for a new home, find one in, in the work that we do. And the 19 million South Africans who are not registered to vote or maybe not participating in democracy must be able to be given that alternative so they come on board. And that takes deliberate resourcing, deliberate messaging towards them and having candidates that can speak to their communities in that regard. So, Rob, before we start discussing coalitions, you've been very vocal in your support for Gayton McKenzie and the Patriotic Alliance. Now, in fact, it was Gayton who collapsed the uh, Johannesburg uh, anti-ANC coalition and put the EFF and the ANC back really in control of Johannesburg. So, so how do you justify your views when the party and the leadership that you've been punting really has worked so actively against opposition politics, taking over city of Tswani, taking over city of Johannesburg? So I've known Gayton for almost three years. And for anyone else that's met him and has got to know him, he is pro-West, pro-capitalist, pro-federalism. He believes in fixing this country, and he is not one of the ANC EFF lackeys. The DA is making a big mistake in scoring huge own goals right now, which Musi will agree with, Corne Mulder of the VF Plus will agree with, and Carter agrees with, and Action SA agrees with. As of today... Somebody I've respected for 20 odd years, Helen Zilla, I say, has lost the plot. But we'll get to coalitions in a minute. Gayton McKenzie served his time in jail, found redemption, and is, is, has launched a political party called the Patriotic Alliance, where he is trying to establish himself in a position where he can deliver for his people and ultimately for South Africa all of the things we on this call believe in. He's one of us. And why did he do what he did in Johannesburg and Swanee? He made it very clear and said publicly, he even told me in advance he was going to do it. He said, the DA are trying to crush me. They treat me as a criminal. They abuse me publicly. And I'm going to show them I mean business, that I'm for real. I have a following and it's growing and I'm to be taken seriously. And he did. That's what he did exactly in Johannesburg and Pretoria. And he's been very open about it. He is now available and ready to join the Moonshot Pact and has not been invited. He has not been invited. So there was a very Stella. interesting, if, I, if yeah. I can, if I can ask, there was a very interesting talk by him at the Business Conference 
where where he basically spoke about how Helen Zilla had humiliated him by not shaking his hand. Now, well, is that worse is, than that? She calls him a criminal. She claims he said things in meetings where Corne Mulder was in those meetings, and Corne has publicly said Gaten never said those things. Jordan Hill Lewis yesterday said that I said if you've got evidence on Gaten's whatever he's done. Show it to me. Prove to me that he is this bad guy and criminal. Oh, we're collecting it, says Jordan. Well, you'd think by now they'd have it, wouldn't you? They have no evidence of his wrongdoing or criminality. It's made so, up by Helen. So I tell you, she's lost the plot. So, I, I mean, you were very vocal this morning on a, on a Twitter piece you put, put out on, on Helen. Not on Twitter. Uh, it was an odd was on uh, other social media, but but one of the things that that when you listen to him speaking at the business conference is that to him politics is personal politics. It's a personal issue between he, him and Helen. At what point in time do we say to our political leaderships, guys, grow up, act in the best interests of the country? Rot. We don't Howard, care if you get on or not. Howard, we, would, would that would be a dream. You're saying it, you're telling it like it is. You know, John Steenhuisen is in America raising money and speaking to big donors, which is his job. He has to do it. He needs to get back here, kick Helen to touch, remind everyone he's in charge of the DA, and reach out to Moosey to join the Moonshot Pact. And you should ask Moosey why he hasn't yet. Bantu Holomisa and Gaten McKenzie. And then we have a real Moonshot Pact and in Johannesburg and Schwane, ANC are gone. In the Western Cape, the ANC is gone forever. And also the Northern Cape. And that would be good for the country. But Helen Ziller and a couple of people on the DA Federal Council, which I call the torture chamber, are resisting it. Thomas Waters or Walters or someone like that are resisting it. And I want to know why. And I think the public of South Africa and all decent people on this call also would like to know why. If John announces a moonshot pact, he needs to have Moosey on board, Bantu Holomisa, and Gaten McKenzie. And he hasn't invited two of those three. So Tim, let's talk about this idea of a moonshot pact. Now we have a proportional representation system. So every vote actually does count. We may be splitting resources when it comes to electioneering, but every vote actually goes to count providing you get one quarter of 1% of the vote in the country. So the question is in a moonshot pact, does joining all of these parties together, are, is the whole bigger than the sum of its parts or by association? Are we going to see that maybe by association with the DA as leader of the, the uh, Moonshot Pact, are we in fact going to see parties lose support? You know, I mean, I think there's no doubt that the South African political system needs to be shaken up a bit. I mean, it would be great if the new, I, I, you know, as an outsider who's, who's not particularly aff affiliated with any of the parties the year, the, uh, I would love to see, uh, you know, a sort of coherent uh, and strong opposition emerged, that'd be great. Um, but, you know, there's something that really worries me, and I, I'd quite like uh, um, Rob and, and Musi to respond to this, because I just, I have this terrible fear about the state of South African politics as it stands at the moment. And I, and I think we're just about to drive into a wall. And the wall is basically this, that the ANC, as predicted, uh, um, drops below 50%, right? And in desperation, uh, it, it then um, uh, uh, allies itself with its, you know, ex uh, uh, members uh, in the EFF uh, because that's how the, the 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 numbers are panning out as we stand. Um, because the, the, there was an Ipsos poll today. I don't know if you saw it. The ANC uh, sitting at forty five percent. Uh, DA at 16%, EFF at 13 in Carter at 4%, and the rest 22%. Um, that basically means that the ANC and the EFF are, you know, the logical coalition partners. Um, so I just worry that, that, that the moonshot shot pact, you know, you have to be scared what you wish for because it might come true. The, uh, because, um, you know, if we think that, that, that you know, there's policy... Uh, uh, you, you know, incoherence now, trust me, with the ANC and the EFF in cahoots, uh, it's going to be uh, a real dog show. 
So if the ANC and the EFF in cahoots, do we see each other at the airport as we all leave? We used to say <laughs> the last person turns off the lights, but we don't even have any lights to turn off anymore. <laughs> no, well, there is that, you know. But I mean, you, you know, the um, actually, you know, I, in a in a sort of perverse way, I I, I think that the the uh, uh, an ANC EFF uh, alliance really would be the end of the ANC and the EFF, you know, the uh, because they would just rip rip each other to pieces, you know, the uh, but in the process. You know, we will. We in South Africa will be in for a really tough time. I mean, I, um, I do. I, uh, sorry, Tim. I, I, I think we mustn't talk about it, and even in hypothetical terms. I actually happen to think that at municipal level, the coalitions that we're seeing are a coalition, are a collusion between the EFF and the ANC, with puppet mayors and front end, because it, it, you cannot vote in a mayor without the majority of those parties agreeing to appoint the current mayor of Johannesburg to make it possible. You know, people say to me, what's your issue? I don't have, I, I have time for Gaten, but I struggle with the notion that it is possible for someone to contemplate availing themselves to be a mayor of multiple towns. It, it goes against the very essence of, the, of local government and your ability to serve the citizens who firstly elected you and you live with them. So given all of the above, it is why it is important to build that fourth leg in the table. We fail at that task, then the cards will fall as they may, as you've described. But I really do not believe that that is the only course of action we've got to take. As it pertains to any moonshot pack, you know, can I, if I'm willing to, Terra Lakota, a number of years ago, when I was setting up coalitions in 2016 in Johannesburg, and you'll recall those, those lasted. We, we never had this revolving door. Herman Mashaba resigned for different reasons, but the coalition stood. We worked together at that time. He said, you know what, Musi, you need to realize your role as leader of the opposition in that you must act in a brotherly manner, exercise the greatest revolutionary trait, which is humility and seek to always bring people together. To simply stand up on a public platform and simply say, well, I'm announcing this thing, come, if you like. Given the history of what was going on in the Johannesburg and the Ikuruleni, et cetera, would be a bit like, Rob, you're a businessman, arising in China and failing to understand the customs and the cultures there and just telling Chinese, you'll do business as I tell you to because I told you so. A sense of humility and respect is a very helpful tool when it comes to politics. Because actually, it's where grandia comes from, where you are able to say to people, wouldn't it be, would it have not been better to say, look, emanating from conference, I'm going to meet with the leaders so that we can have a discussion. And imagine if four or five leaders came out and said, we are forming a moonshot pact. That's a different attitude and and, and process than what it is, because then the agenda is consistent and the invitation is broader. Let me say this other thing, that the, the Moonshot Pact is a replication of another process that's been going on. I've been meeting with the opposition leaders, such as Bantu, such as the ACDP, such as Good, such as the many others. We've been meeting, even uh, Corne Mulda will attest to this issue. We met, there was a study tour last year that brought this issue on, on the table. So a conversation is being had about how you become effective in opposition. I was with uh, Peter Hunova over the last couple of days, had a conversation to say, how do we build this coalition? So, so the very suggestion that there isn't this conversation taking place is false. And secondly, the history and practice of simply just announcing things and hoping people will fall into line. And then when it heads to elections, delegitimizing the other parties by saying a vote for a smaller party is a wasted vote. People have a recent history of that. And I think you cannot introduce Basman's gap in a universe where you are trying to work with people. And I want to urge again, if we restore to first principles, let us act with genuine respect. Let us come back to sitting together and saying, here's what the pact looks like. So my response to the Moonshot Pact was quite clear. I said, we'll work with people we have shared values with, we will go with parties that have a centrist view so that we have an actual plan about what we are going to do. Because the mistake that's going on in Johannesburg and in the Kurleni, et cetera, 
is because you are appointing people without a plan. So all those people's primary interest is merely just to occupy positions. So I'm not shut off to it. I'm merely saying, let's come back. Let's craft a plan. Let's agree on what needs to be done for South Africa. And then when we have that, we can then sit back and say, well, right, how do we then execute against it? But to really just simply go into it and just simply say, are we going to implement? Which plan are we going to implement? I don't know. We'll sign off and we'll have a revolving door of presidency come 2024. It'll be a disaster worse than what we've seen currently. So in another minute, we're going to hand over to Benji, who's going to kind of try to work out the sentiment of the hundreds and hundreds of comments that are coming in on Facebook, on Zoom and on YouTube, and also pose some of those questions to our panelists. I want to remind everyone, if you're watching on Zoom, please, uh, please don't forget Put a question or a comment into the chat section or the Q&A section. If you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, please use the comment section there and Danny will bring those questions across to Benji to allow you to ask those questions again. We want to make sure that you're part of this conversation as well. And if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget, click that like and subscribe button, please. That certainly helps us and helps you and allows us to notify you when new webinars are coming up. And hopefully we'll have some very interesting ones coming up in, in the very near future. So my final question before I hand over to Benji to sum up the sentiment and ask the questions, Rob Hersel, they say that only fools and prophets predict the future. I, uh, I don't know if you're a prophet, but I'm going to try to put you on the spot. What does South African politics look like after our next elections? So there are three scenarios. The one is the ANC-EFF win in some form of collusion and coalition, and we can survive that. Civil society is very strong in South Africa. Business will eventually grow some spine. We can fight back. We will actually survive five years of, of an EFF-ANC um, combination. It'll be the end of the ANC and the end of the EFF, and the pendulum will swing so far away of, from that because the ANC is already collapsing. The second scenario is the DA teams up with the, I can't, don't call them the good wing because there's no good ANC at the moment, the reform wing of the ANC, which is Enoch Gonaguana and Helen thinks Cyril, but he's not long, he's gone soon and Paul Meshatila will take over. And that's a possible scenario and Helen's playing that game. She wants to team up with the ANC for the election. And the third is that a coalition of the good actually gets its act together. And we've got 14 to 15 months to go. A lot can happen. And that coalition gets the 51 to 55% with a Musi Maimani, Herman Mashaba, or other as president of that coalition. And that, to me, would be the winning formula. And that's why I want the coalition of the good to come together now. Work it out and win. So, Benji, there have been a lot of comments that have come in over the last hour. What are people yeah. saying and thinking? Well, one of the most entertaining things has been to watch Rob answer some of those questions. So, so I thank you, Rob, and I thank you for your candor. Rob, I happened to be at the Biz News Conference when you made your second speech uh, announcing your cabinet. And what was interesting for me, and, it, and it's part of the sentiment that's come up, that earlier that morning, the brilliant R.W. Johnson had spoken. And I, I, I'm sure you'll remember, but he, he linked Cyril Ramaphosa to a previous leader called P.W. Buerta. And while Cyril Ramaphosa was so much like P.W. Buerta, and it was one of the biggest takedowns I've ever heard. And it was enormously, uh, uh, I mean, you'll talk about it later, but then you stood up and I think you said Futsak uh, Cyril, and we came up with this with this coalition, uh, the, the cabinet, Grayton McKenzie as your president. And you've spoken a lot about the span of business and, the, and the, this need for business to have the seat at the table. So maybe you can talk me through why you think R.W. Johnson never had half the pushback you had. And another comment that you made at that conference was that you actually get quite a lot of calls after your previous call from, uh, from some uh, ministers and people saying thank you. And uh, I'm interested in you talking about that because Part of what the sentiment is, is that part of businesses need to have a seat at the table actually plays into the hands of the corrupt and plays into the hands where the, the, the reformers want uh, people like you and business to stand up. So maybe you can take that, that question from there. So Tony Leon writes better than I do. 
I've tried my attempt at writing, obviously through Biz News, because Daily Maverick won't even speak to me. Maybe Tim will. Maybe I've got a chance now. Um, and and Tony writes beautifully, and he and he really is has a is a visionary. He sees it all. But I called him one day and said, Tony, why don't you actually name names? You know, why don't you point out the bad guys like um, Martin Kingston? You know, who I really don't like. There we go. Everyone, you've heard the name. Um, why don't you point out the names of the people who've been kissing ANC butt or propping up the ANC for benefit of their own? And Tony says it, it detracts from the message. Okay. I've gone the other way. I've called out names. I called Fakila and Balula Moron. I mean, he is pretty damn stupid for anyone who knows him. And, and have insulted Gweta Matasha and, you know, called him incompetent. And I call people out by name. And it seems to work. There's a massive groundswell of support for being honest, telling the truth, calling out names, but no one else does it. So, you know, have I taken it a lot of hits? Well, you know, just ask Daily Maverick about their lovely cartoon of me by Sapiro. You know, thanks for that, Tuma. You don't have to take the blame. I blame the toxic femininity in your organization, not you. Um, and I've been, I got hammered by uh, financial mail by some creepy journalist called Mark Roper. You know, all the ad hominem attacks. So I've taken a lot of hits, but I'm not going to stop because I think you have to actually call out the names. And in the Zondo Commission, they named 200 cadres. 200 cadres by name. Have you heard anything more about that? No. So, you know, we spoke earlier, Howard raised the issue of, you know, do we just forgive and move on? You know, the Truth and Reconciliation Committee. Do we just forgive the Guptas? Do we forgive Zuma? But you just can't keep doing that. 85% of murders, of murderers, get away with murder in this country. So you've got to name names. People have to stand up, show a bit of spine, name names, and stick their chins out. And Daily Maverick does do that in uncovering all the evil in the government, and I praise them for it. So, Rob, in, in, if we go on the title of this, uh, Saving South Africa, you say business, grow a spine, name names, get them out there. And, uh, and let people kind of uh, suffer the consequences for their, their kind of ill deeds. Yeah, and stop saying being polite to Cyril. You know, he tells you all the things you want to hear in business meetings, and he walks side to side and laughs at all of us. Just say no. Don't clap when he makes speeches. Boom off the stage. He's useless. We know it. Let's tell him. It is refreshing. I mean, it is Thank how we it is refreshing it's a, when you... it's a it's a it's a great answer now I, I if i can interject with one question from johnny Byrne and musi it's for you and he said he was actually listening to cyril give a speech the other day i think there were six people online busy watching cyril's speech and he said the only applause he got was in fact when he said the 350 rand grant a month will continue are there certain tickets to the game in order to be electable in south africa do you have to support social grants? Is that a requirement? Do you have to support BE? Is that a requirement for electability amongst the broad base of the electorate in South Africa? I mean, first of all, it would be given the state of where South Africa is, I don't see welfare as a failure. I actually think if I was an ANC person, I'd tout that. And he's right to do that because actually in the main, it, is, it has saved many people from serious, serious deepening poverty. We don't talk enough about poverty in this country. You know, more than 50% of our people live below the upper poverty line. And when I talk about a job in every home, it's a recognition of the fact that if we didn't have welfare, you would have a crisis second to none given the deepening levels of poverty in this country. You just have to go to a community like the Northern Cape and have a look for yourself, where you see a combination of abuse of alcohol and, and, and certainly fetal alcohol syndrome and the educational outcomes, you start to appreciate how complex the issue is. But as for the ticket issue, people even on welfare are desperate for work. We People tell me all the time, they say, Musi, even the, the free stuff that the state wants to give them, they think to themselves, I heard a powerful phrase, and I'm sure there are Kosa people here who would, they use the phrase, which means I'm not a snake. 
even if you give me a house, you I can't live in a home I, in a hole I didn't build for myself. People want dignity. They want to know that they're empowered to do things themselves. So to me, the ticket items is to make sure that at least broadly speaking, people must know they'll have the freedoms, the freedoms to choose, the freedom to better their lives. Half the reason, and I'm not trying to self-promote, is that people people look at me and they go, Musi, I want to follow you because they, 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 they see the fact that here's someone who grew up in Soweto in the township and has gotten somewhere and they want that for their kids. Most people want progress in society. So to me, the ticket items is to go, we will guarantee your freedoms and we will look after the most vulnerable because that is our fundamental act of justice as a, as a society and as a state. And I would call upon business. You know, people say to me, business doesn't talk enough against the state and against corruption. When we were talking coalition earlier, we have to bring all the role players together, business, civil society. It's not just a coalition of political parties. That would be a mistake. It does not reset society. It does not give us a vision for the next 30 years. Because we have to ask business, what is your contribution to our own sense of social stability? Before it's just a sense of just like, whatever. If it's about, we must reward people who keep people employed. When someone says, it would have been easier for me to lay off people in the face of load shedding, but I'm going to employ people and keep them employed. We must incentivize those people and celebrate them because they keep the stability of the country on the table. When there's a, there are so many NGOs in this country that are doing a phenomenal job. They have an interest in governance in this community and we must invite them because those people, many of them will make excellent members of parliament if we give them the legislative framework for them to come to parliament in a direct elections bill for them to come and vote for people. So to me, let's broaden the coalition, but let's recognize the fact that what most citizens want in this country, they want to know their freedoms and they want to know you look after their most vulnerable. And by the way, grants, I'm just given to people who have kids. They are also a welfare space where the disabled are looked after. They are a welfare space where those who cannot be able to find work. That's why I've always been fighting, even to a small degree of a basic income grant, so that we can make sure no one ever dips to below a poverty line. It must be an insult and an injustice to all of us that someone can go to bed hungry. And so to me, I don't mind that sort of thing. I just want to make sure that there's a pathway to exiting grants and a pathway to success, and we can get that right. You know, uh, Musi, uh, and I know that you uh, uh, deal with this information a lot, but Franz Grenier from the Social Research Foundation, where he says, uh, you know, the bulk of South Africans actually feel uh, the same way. They feel the same way, exactly what you say about it's a, it's a, misunderstanding that people want grants. It's a misunderstanding people want a job, as, as the panel has said. And um, the idea that most of the South Africans are good, good, honest people is like one of the most inspiring things that, that Franz Cronier actually comes out that we actually agree on much more than we disagree. But one of the, one of the questions that, that emerge out of, um, out of this discussion on how to fix South Africa so on one hand, we're saying go vote, vote for the um, vote for the party that you think can best lead you into into the future. On the other hand, we're saying you know really we need to uh, stand up, have a backbone, and call people out. I would be interested from the media side, uh, Tim. What would you say? Uh, 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 and the the question around some of like the the noise that's going on, which people bring up, like the RCC and BRICS and inviting Putin and all of those things. How much, how much should we think about those type of things or how much of it is just noise? Oh, I don't think it's noise at all. I mean, I, the, the um, you know, the, the media in South Africa, I mean, our primary job is to bring people the facts. And uh, you know, there's a there's uh, and and to uh, to make sure that that we are uh, you know reflecting honestly uh, um, and with depth um, what is actually happening in the society. That's the first job. That's our and and in order to do that, you know, we um, you know this is <laughs> you know this is not easy, right? Because you have an extraordinary number of constraints, both uh, you know. Uh, um, uh, uh, logistical and financial, you know, um, in reaching that point. But uh, the, um, 
um, and and you know a lot of a lot of um, you know and I'm a kind of victim of this myself. Uh, um, people, a lot of people want the, the the media to be commentators first and foremost, um, and we we should uh, uh, resist that temptation uh, because we all have our views, you know. Um, but but our function is different from you know. Uh, our views, as far as the the you know the 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 all of the kind of surrounding things are around uh, you know sort of politics, I think they're fantastically important because they all they all add up into uh, into the you know into the, uh, uh, the 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 crisis that we uh, find ourselves. Even minor things, even small things like the. You know, like the, the, the you know BRICS membership or something. It's not a small thing; it's a, quite a big thing actually. But uh, um, you know, diplomacy in general is very important, and I, and I think it's it's uh, it's a it's a it's an important reflection on South Africa's decline that uh, you know that President Ramaphosa didn't get invited to the G7 this year. Um, mm. It just shows where where South Africa is is being uh, seen. Um, internationally, and you know, investors they notice that stuff. You know, it's this is not irrelevant, right? Um, uh, so do you think the invitation? I was listening on the way home, actually, from work. That the invitation to Putin has it come, hasn't come. It's a bit of a joke, like trying to find out what actually is happening. Is that noise, or is that a real issue we should be worried about? Oh no, we should definitely be worried about it. Uh, I mean, I you know, I think the. Uh, I mean, it, we should worry about it from a whole bunch of different points of view. First of all, you, you know, there's a the, the continent really wants South Africa to be genuinely impartial in this battle, but in the in the the, the greater geopolitical fight. Um, and South Africa has pretends to be impartial, but but is obviously not. Um, and uh, I think we've been found out. Um, you know, we're, we're, I mean. Uh, the, uh, and it's dangerous for us. I mean, I, you know, you, you, uh, um, it's uh, you know uh, something like seventy percent of our our uh, uh, exports uh, go to countries outside of the the you know the sort of BRICS block. Uh, they're much more important than than uh, sort of just economically. Just if if South Africa could just be sensible, that would be a big step in the right direction. <laughs> So the last, maybe uh, if we could have a, um, a, a brief answer for a few questions have come in. So what, would, what advice would you give my children? What advice now? What would you tell them uh, is the best thing to do to be a positive influence for South Africa? Uh, so let, Mercy, let's start with you. What would you give uh, the youth? What would the advice, the one bit of advice you would give them to help fix South Africa? Obviously, don't get involved. Get involved. We've been exiled in our thinking for far too long. Too many people think in silos. Get involved. Every little bit of action in this country is vital in building this nation. You know, when I table this 10-point plan, one of the things I propose is a national vocation, uh, uh, voluntary service for a year for all uh, post matriculants. The reason I want to do that isn't just because I think that young people need a year's gap year where they can do public service, but it's so that a child who lives in Santon can go do some work in Alexandra and not feel like Alexandra is a place where the other lives, but that as fellow South Africans, we have shared experiences. That a child who lives in Alexandra can also go work in Santon and work out the fact that, wait, hang on, this are, these are not, because we perpetuate divisions whilst we keep the spatial network the way it is, but furthermore, that keeping a, almost a neighborly existence without ever having to have an interaction of values. And so for me, my advice to my kids, and I say it even to my own kids, we reject the notion that I guess we are a mixed race family, so we don't have a choice. But I always say to my kids, go to Kailicha and work out what it's, it, it's like for life in Kailicha, because what it gives them is a sense of shared ownership about our country. We can't just only own our own neighborhoods as South Africans. We have to own the whole, 
And we have to say to ourselves, for us to be one, we have to recognize that South Africa is diverse and our South Africa means all of us can contribute to it. So to me, get involved. Don't just vote. Get involved even in your CPF, especially for people on this call. In your community policing forum, go do that. Every municipality in this country has to table an IDP plan that tells us what they're going to do in that IDP. Participate in that because you are giving your feedback into this country. As business people, I know everyone has been saying, call out corruption, call out corruption. I think that's one chapter to the, to the whole story. Actually get more involved in being able to not only work with parties that you support, but ultimately making sure that in your business practice, you can contribute to society and give ideas and not sit on the sidelines. And furthermore, it would be true for my kids, for any other kids. Go and experience a South Africa that you didn't grow up with because it makes us full of South Africans. It's what Archbishop Tutu said. None of us are born complete. All of us need one another to be complete human beings. That's how a child experiences the world. And the South Africans, that's part of what we need to do. So if you've never been to a soccer game, go to one. If you've never been to a rugby game, go to one and live with South Africans and say, I want to experience the fullness of this country. Love that. Tim? You know, well, I would say, you know, uh, uh, be an entrepreneur. Uh, honestly, I, 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 we have... And you can see uh, young people are already going that path. They, they are gradually leaving the political uh, uh, kingdom behind. And, you know, sorry, Musi, I think it's a good thing. <laughs> I think, um, you know, it's, uh, um, we need people to be uh, creative business people um, and, to, and, to, and they will pull us, you know, forward. Um, uh, I'm sorry, that's just what I think. And no, and, and Tim, don't, don't, don't hear me saying, I'm saying all activism is about activism in politics. All activism must be there. See, I would hate for, my answer. I want them to go answer. and be activists <laughs> in communities and in all of that. It is part of okay. us building. Mercy. Building is building. Lucy, you ran out of time then. Um, four <laughs> quick things. Advice for young people. One, read about capitalism and read about freedom. Start reading proper books. Two, when you turn 18, register and vote. Only 10% of people between 18 and 25 are planning to vote. It's a disgrace. Three, when you go to university, don't waste time studying political science, journalism, or any of those soft topics. You can do them <laughs> on weekends or learn from a, fr a, from, a, from a friend. Study the STEM subjects, engineering, accounting, science, medicine, maybe law. And finally, if the ANC and EFF do get in next year, leave the country. Go away. Go and uh, get skills somewhere else and be ready to come back when the Madalas on this call have got rid of the ANC, put a decent mob in power, and we can turn this country around. If I was a young person, I wouldn't waste my time hanging around here trying to build a business in South Africa that's overregulated with theft like BE, theft like EWC, and idiots running the country. Go overseas, come back when things are fixed. So we, we're busy winding up and we're gonna end this webinar within the next five or six minutes or so. Um, Musi, I have a quick question for you that comes from Glenn Wallman. Uh, and then uh, let me tell you what my final two questions to the entire panel are. The final two questions after my question to you are, tomorrow is, is Freedom Day. It marks 28 years since we as a country really got born into liberation and democracy. Give us one leadership lesson for the country to everyone and tell us about the importance of Freedom Day tomorrow. Those are going to be my last two questions. But before that, Musi, Glenn Wallman's question is, are you electable? Is it potentially possible that you could be the South African president in our lifetime? It's, 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 sit, sit. Let me not say it. City Press and the SRF research did a, did a poll recently about who are the top 10 political leaders in the country. So yes, at number one, you have Thabo Mbeki. At number two is Cyril. Number three, you've got Jacob Zuma. So all of those are on their way out. So those are the three. In the next amongst the three, there's only a one point difference between myself, Helen, Julius, and myself. And then after that, you get a 10 point drop to get to the rest. So all I'm simply saying is that of the current opposition leaders, 
outside of the DAEFF, I'll be the most electable leader coming into the elections next year. So that's not my report. That's the report that the, even the SRF and the City Press published last weekend, if you, if you read that. Okay. So, so let's start with Tim, our final two questions. The importance of Freedom Day for South Africa and for you personally, and give us one lesson in leadership that you would love to share with our audience this evening. Wow. Um, but, you know, I, I mean, I, I think like all South Africans, I, I mean, I just, uh, I just marvel at, uh, at that fantastic moment. You know what I mean? It's sort of uh, because um, uh, uh, it's, uh, it, it required such an enormous leap of faith. Um, and maybe that's the leadership lesson too, that uh, you, you know, you, you, you um, uh, the, 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 there is a kind of spiritual rebirth that South Africa needs. And we can take inspiration, I think, from, um, from Freedom Day to, to reach that point. Um, and we need to, 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 to believe that we can um, to really just crack the mold and uh, um, break out. Mursi, tell us about your leadership lessons and, and the meaning of Freedom Day to you. I, you know, I, I think maybe as a person of faith, you, you look at people like Moses, you think about this time. And actually, I learned such an important lesson recently. I learned that Moses is exiled because he sees injustice and commits murder. So, and then he goes away. And then when he comes back to the famous Pharaoh, let my people go, he changes his entire attitude and takes a different approach to resolve a, qu a question of injustice. South Africa was best served by revolution, by protest, by all of that, and we delivered the 94 moment. The leadership courage now is to find a different level and maybe not too different to what Tim is saying, a deeper spiritual leadership that simply says to yourself now, we've got to bring everybody together to deliver a new transition. It's not going to be protest. It's not going to be any of that. It's about bringing a leadership, values-based, conscious leadership that then leads this country forward in a way of renewed prosperity. I don't, I don't regret the last 30 years. As, di as, in, as different and as difficult as they've been, they've brought us to this point. And what we've got to do is to say, what hope and courage are we in this generation, in this time, going to take going forward? And so for me, I'm more hopeful. I'm more, I feel we've got a credible plan that we've put before. I'm more hopeful about the fact that we've got a whole set of leaders that are cropping up everywhere in different parts that are sick and tired of institutional politics, couldn't be bothered about it. And what they really want is a new sense upon which they can really chart a future. And they are across all communities and across all races. So if you are walking away from tonight, if you draw any hope and inspiration, I could say this to you. There's a new generation, there's a new crop, and they are asking different questions about their future rather than trying to solve problems of their parents. So my leadership lesson is really don't think what you did in the past is going to get us there. We've got to do a new, and even to the person here who's going to vote next year, if you think you must just follow the same path and vote for the same old party you've always voted for, well, you'll get what you've always got. Mandela reminds us again, rather vote with your hopes rather than your fears, because we might sit here and say, we fear the EFF, we fear this, we fear that. No, no, no. Let's hope for a South Africa and give expression to votes in that way. So I'm, I'm for me, in that space saying new tools, new generation, new leadership, and will prosper this country because its people are its strength. So Rob, that means the last word of the evening actually falls to you. But before we do that, I'm gonna ask all the people watching us this evening, just to leave us a comment. Tell us about your hopes, tell us about your dreams, tell, about, tell us about your moment in 1994 where you voted for the first time in a democratic South Africa and tell us about your feelings tomorrow. And I'll ask you please to do that in the comment section of YouTube, on Zoom and on Facebook. But Rob, talk to us about leadership and the importance of freedom. So Kathy Bowman, I saw your comments and um, I just want to say, I came back to South Africa after 31 years abroad. I'm not leaving. 
I believe in this country. I believe in its people. We have it all. If you follow Franz Cronier's incredible research, which Benji um, mentioned, and Benji, you know France pretty well. France says the majority of South Africans have had it with the ANC. A third of ANC voters are ready to leave the ANC right now if the coalition can start stop fighting and start working together. And that is what I've been trying to do behind the scenes, in front of the scenes, calling out names, is get these guys to work together, guys and gals. And people go, Rob's always supporting the, the Patriotic Alliance. I know Mick Gayton. I believe he's one of us. And I believe the DA need to reach out to him, embrace him, and embrace Moosey, Action SA, VF Plus, and the other good people come together and win the election in 2024. And this country will take off like a rocket. And the young people who I've advised to leave will stay. But hundreds of thousands of South Africans who have left the country will return. And there's a great positive future for us. So, Kathy, I hope that answers your question. I am being positive. So I, I want to be positive for a second because I grew up in apartheid South Africa, being told that this country would never, ever solve its initial problem. And that the initial problem was the problem of apartheid. And while we still got a long way to go, we really achieved a miracle in this country. But we achieved that miracle by people not sitting on the sidelines. If you're not prepared to get involved, if you're just going to wait and see, then I must say, Rob, I actually agree with you. People must rather go. But this is the time for every South African to roll up their sleeves and actually get involved. And it may mean that you go out and you register voters and you make sure that your kids and your grandkids are registered to vote. And you go out and you make sure that communities are active and you're participating. You know, democracy doesn't happen once every five years. Miraculously, once every five years, we get an opportunity to overthrow our government through a peaceful means called an election. But democracy is so much deeper. It's about being involved in your community. It's about looking after your policemen. It's about going to, to your city councillor and making sure that they're active. It's about filling up the potholes on your streets where you live. And it's about taking responsibility for your own life. And if you're not prepared to take responsibility for your own life, it's better you go somewhere else. But if you believe that we have a country to really fight for, if you believe that we have a future we can really build for ourselves and our families and our future, then now is the time to get involved in whatever way that you can. And that's why tonight, I think Benji has brought me a lot of hope. We've heard a lot of diverse views we understand there's no silver bullet to, to solving everything, but there are people of goodwill willing to change bit by bit and make the country a better future. And that's why I've enjoyed tonight so much. Tim Cohen to the best business journalist in South Africa, to Rob Hersov to really the most outspoken business person in South Africa, and to Musi Maimani, who's really leading a revolution and probably the most credible black leader standing for an election that can represent all of us in a new South Africa. I'm enormously grateful to all of you for having joined this evening. To Danny Kadar, who's been on control and who's brought questions across, we're enormously grateful. And to Benji Porter, who has always provided such great inspiration and insightful questioning, a huge thank you. And that's right, Benji, I want to give the last word to you. All right, how are we? I, th I want to say ditto to everything you said. Um, and that's, but I, I, I think that sometimes we, we live a life of where we, 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 we remember the old with positivity and we fear the future with negativity, unfortunately. We have this natural default. But actually, you know, whatever your belief, I believe in a God, so I believe Hashem has given us this great ability to do far more than we can imagine. And I guess that that's where some of Rob and Musi and Tim's like agitation comes from, is that the ability for humans to make an enormous impact in whatever they do, I think we underestimate. And with the brilliant people that we have in the community and the broader community and the average South African, as I said, with Franz Cunier's research, which just shows that so many people are just so aligned that it's actually the minorities that are misaligned. The minorities are misaligned and we get sucked into that. And so I say, just remember, just remember that, that we've got this enormous ability 
And we all actually so similar and we've got similar hopes, similar goals for us, for our children, for our parents, for everyone in our lives. And that if we could just find that kind of, re- uh, the, the same result that we had in 1994 with the, that beautiful uh, 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 year and our freedom, that we can just draw on that, I think we can do amazing stuff. So to everyone who's watched us this evening, a huge thank you for giving us your time and sharing your insights, your questions, and your comments with the most remarkable panel. We'll see you again in a few weeks' time. Thank you for joining us. Good night, everyone.